My name is Marcus Dobbs and I'm an engineering geologist with the BGS. In this talk I'll present the engineering geology of the Singapore bedrock, which is the focus of much of the new geological memoir, practitioner's guide and geological maps, and where many of the new implications for engineering geology arise within the revised framework. My intention is to demonstrate how the new framework can benefit those involved in the planning and development sectors by allowing for more robust constraint of geological variability, and in particular of the distribution of lithologies, discontinuities, alteration and groundwater, which in turn will enable better prediction of subsurface properties and behaviour, and also of the occurrence of geological hazards and resources. The first point I'd like to make is don't bin your old data or favourite publications. They still have lots of value. There are numerous publications on the geology of Singapore that cover a multitude of topics ranging from general engineering geological considerations, properties of particular geological units, weathered rocks and residual soils, and also important case studies that cover ground investigation and engineering projects. There is in fact a useful table in the practitioner's guide that shows the relationship between the old and new geological frameworks. It highlights where there is relatively direct correlation. These are the units shown within the green boxes. For example, the Gombak Pluton in the BCA framework is linked to the Gombak Norite in the DSTA framework. Units with broad equivalency are shown within the orange boxes. For example, the Sentosa group, Jurong group and Kuzi formation are linked to the Jurong formation. And units with no equivalency in red boxes. For example, the Bukit Batok formation which is a Cretaceous sedimentary unit that was not previously recognised in Singapore. I think the important thing to note is that often the equivalency is not at the same level. For example, the DSTA Jurong formation cannot be directly related to units within the BCA stratigraphy at the formational level. In fact, it's broadly equivalent to eight formations in the BCA stratigraphy. Where possible, data available in the literature have been collated and presented alongside the BCA deep ground investigation data for each geological unit in Appendix 2 of the Geological Memoir and also within Section 8 of the Practitioner's Guide. Though, as you'll appreciate, this will frequently be at the highest level within the framework, i.e. at the centre level for the intrusive igneous units and the group level for the sedimentary units. As mentioned in previous talks, Data and material derived from the BCA Deep Ground Investigation Programme are pretty extensive. They include approximately 120 200 metre deep boreholes, from which over 20,000 metres of rock cores were recovered and logged, 3,400 in situ and laboratory tests, and a further 235 outcrops, which were also examined by the BGS and where suitable sampled and logged. This programme represents one of the most comprehensive city-scale geological investigations ever undertaken, especially if we consider the depths from which the cores were recovered. If we overlay the new geological map, you can see the boreholes, shown in black dots, and outcrop localities, shown as green dots, cover a good part of mainland Singapore, several offshore islands, and importantly, most of the geological units, though not quite all, and certainly not in the same degree. It is this data set, derived from the Ground Investigation Programme, that forms the basis of the assessment presented here, and also the Engineering Geology chapter of the memoir and Section 8 of the Practitioner's Guide. Lithology is fundamental to engineering geology, as different lithologies have different physical, mechanical and chemical properties, and therefore also different potential for hazards and resources to occur. So one of the first things we can do to get a better idea of the likely variability in the subsurface is to look at the relative abundance of different lithologies within the BCA units. The analysis that follows is based solely on logged outcrops and boreholes and is therefore only a sample of the variability of each unit, not necessarily the actual variability. For completeness, where data from units were not available, the variability has been estimated from descriptions in the literature or at outcrops. The rock type terms used are also very broad, which has been done in order to facilitate the analysis. For the lithostratigraphical units, the first and perhaps most important point is that they are, for the most part, highly heterolithic, 
and frequently contains several rock types, which include mudstone, sandstone, conglomerate, volcaniclastic rock, and carbonate rock. In fact, only the Kent Ridge member, Nanyang member, and Pengarang formation are really dominated by a single lithology type, which in this case is volcaniclastic rock. Volcaniclastic rock does though occur in greater amounts than was previously realized and is found in variable quantities in nearly all pre-Xenozoic sedimentary units, ranging from dominant in the units already discussed to subordinate amounts in the rest of the Jurong group, Buena Vista and Bukit Batok formations. There are even some minor amounts in the Tanjong Rimau formation of the Sentosa group. Also worth noting is that carbonate rock is more widespread than previously thought. It is identified as the dominant lithology type in the Pandan formation and is a significant component of the Tuas formation. It's also found in smaller proportions in the Boonlay formation and Clementi member, though in these two units it's usually only as very thin beds or nodules. Even in the lithodemic units, there is a significant degree of heterogeneity. For the most part, they are dominated by granitic rocks, that is, coarse-grained felsic igneous rocks. But there is also a significant proportion of finer-grained microgranitic rocks, which are present in significant proportions in the Simpang and Ubin flutons. They are also that abundant in the dairy farm fluton that a separate fasces dominated by these rocks is identified on the BCA geological map. Significant proportions of mafic igneous rocks also occur, principally as coarse grained gabbroic rock. While these are mainly found in the Gombak pluton, mafic rock is also found mingled with felsic rock in significant proportions of the Cho Chu Kang, Simpang, and Pula Ubin plutons. In addition to the more conventional types of rocks I've shown, there are also a number of other more esoteric rock types and features which can be encountered in the bedrock geology of Singapore and produce even greater variability. This includes fault rocks, which are particularly common in the Tuas and Buena Vista formations, where they are associated with the Murai and Pasialaba thrust systems. The Bukit Batok formation, which itself has a strong spatial association with the Bukitima fault zone, and the Cho Chu Kang Pluton, possibly associated with the proto Bukatima fault zone. Fault rocks have though also been identified in several other units and should therefore be considered possible in all bedrock units within Singapore. These rocks include both highly foliated myelinite, produced by ductile deformation, and unfoliated cataclasite, produced by brittle deformation. Myelinite in an unweathered state is always a rock, in the rock mechanic sense of the word, and can be extremely strong, although it may exhibit a high degree of strength and isotropy and facility, depending on how well developed the foliation is. On the other hand, cataclasite, which includes fault breccia and gouge, can occur as very soft to very stiff soil, or as rock with a significant range in strength. Another example is tuppersite, which is relatively common throughout the Bukatima Centre, but has not been observed within the Pula Sukudu Pluton or the Singapore Dyke Swarm. Tuppersite consists of rock fragments in a matrix of hydrothermal minerals or igneous rock. It forms in fractures during the forceful passage of highly pressurised hydrothermal fluid or magma through a rock mass. Tuffersite affected rock is frequently found to be substantially altered by hydrothermal fluids to form extremely weak to weak greenish grey rock, though it may also be further altered by the precipitation and dissolution of mineral filling, producing rock that may vary from weak to strong. Rarely the tuffersite matrix is strong, but still brittle, grey to black glassy looking material, which in thin section consists of intensely fragmented wall rock. The thickness of individual fractures in the BCA Deep Ground Investigation Program varies from 0.5 to 5.2 metres, however significantly greater thicknesses of tuffersite affected zones have also been encountered. Tuffersite affected rock masses will likely consist of relatively narrow metre scale central pipes or lenses of intensely fractured rock surrounded by relatively broad envelopes, possibly a kilometre in scale within which the size and density of tuffersite bearing fractures will diminish outwards. 
these tuffocyte effective rock masses will be significantly weaker than non effective rock masses, as is illustrated here by the 8 metres of apparently contiguous borehole core. So, in summary, there is a high degree of lithological variability in nearly all the bedrock units of Singapore. However, the degree of variability and the lithological proportions does vary between units, and this can be useful for discriminating between units, and the units themselves can also be used as a first order indicator of the likely lithology types and degree of variability that will be encountered in the subsurface prior to any ground investigation. Discontinuities may be planes or zones of weakness, conduits for or barriers to fluid flow, and can represent an abrupt change in lithology. The frequency, magnitude, orientation and condition of discontinuities therefore governs multiple properties of the subsurface, in particular rock mass strength and permeability. The results are a strong spatial association between faulting and weathering and between major fault zones and the distribution of geological units. Discontinuities therefore ought to have a significant role in the overall distribution of intact rock and soil properties. Recent studies have identified significantly more faults in Singapore than were previously recorded. Furthermore, those that were known, in particular the Bukitima, Henderson Road, Murai and Pasialaba faults, were also now considered to be substantially more extensive and complex than previously thought. It's also now apparent the faults in Singapore have three dominant trends northeast to southwest, north northwest to south southeast, and northwest to southeast. The majority of faults in Singapore are likely to be associated with a damage zone comprising slip surfaces, fractured rock, and fault rock, where the effects of deformation become increasingly intense towards the main dislocation plane. Major fault zones particularly those that have accommodated multiple episodes of displacement, are likely to be highly complex and comprise multiple faults and damage zones that vary in intensity. For example, the Bukatima fault zone is thought to be a complex distribution of anastomosing faults that also includes blocks of relatively intact rock between zones of damage. Significant variation in rock mass strength should also be anticipated within and in close proximity to the Murai and Pasialaba thrust zones. They will also have generated significant geological complexity, stacking older strata over younger strata in multiple repeating packages. Correlating boreholes and predicting which lithology types are likely to be present laterally or horizontally will therefore be significantly more challenging in these volumes. It's worth noting that the location of faults in Singapore is highly uncertain due to the difficulty in verifying the geology at surface. Mapped faults should therefore be considered an indicator of the likely presence of the effects of faulting, rather than the definitive position of a discrete or specific fault plane. The nature of all fractures within the subsurface of Singapore is further complicated by temporal variations in groundwater chemistry. As a consequence, faults and joints may be partly or wholly filled by vein-forming mineral precipitates, predominantly calcite and quartz. This process of precipitation and dissolution has changed considerably over time and is still ongoing. The distribution of fractures that are mineralised and therefore sealed and cohesive, or demineralized and therefore permeable and non-cohesive, is extremely difficult to predict and may be extremely localised. BCA deep ground investigation boreholes and information available in the published literature indicate that karstic cavities range in size up to 13.5 metres and have been observed at depths ranging from 20 to 100 metres below the ground, though deeper cast is also highly likely. Analysis of data acquired from the BCA deep ground investigation also indicates that more than 1.5% of the carbonate rock within the Pandan and Tuas formations may be affected by dissolution. The distribution of cast is likely to be highly irregular, but given the extremely low porosity of the Jurong group rocks, it's likely to be more concentrated in the vicinity of faults and fault zones, and where steeply dipping beds intersect more acidic near-surface meteoric water. In summary, within Singapore, 
the discontinuities, in particular faults and fault zones, will be the dominant factor controlling rock mass strength, potential groundwater flow rates, and the depth of weathering. They will therefore be one of the prime considerations in the support required for and the approach taken to subsurface excavation in bedrock. Dissolution of veins and carbonate rock will also result in significant localised variation in the rock mass strength and depending on groundwater level and the connectivity between karstic cavities and faults may also present zones of very high groundwater flow. Dissolution features are also therefore a significant hazard for building foundations and subsurface excavations. In addition to contending with the variation produced by heterolithic units, discontinuities and dissolution, the bedrock of Singapore has also been substantially modified by a number of forms of mineral alteration. Principal among these are metamorphism and weathering. Mineral alteration invariably results in changes to physical and mechanical properties that along with lithology and discontinuities must be carefully considered in order to fully appreciate the subsurface ground conditions. All pre-Cretaceous lithostratigraphical units in Singapore have been subjected to at least low-grade regional metamorphism, which has resulted in recrystallization and the development of foliation. The effects of metamorphism are not, however, evenly distributed. Two metamorphic cleavages are generally visible within the Sajahat formation, except where it has been altered by later thermal metamorphism. While in the Jurong and Sentosa groups, a single weak to strong cleavage is developed in some places, usually in finer grained rocks and on fold limbs, but in other parts, especially in coarser grained rocks such as sandstone and conglomerate, it is weak or absent. Dynamic metamorphism has also occurred locally within high strain zones produced during regional metamorphic events. These are most notable within the Jurong Group, Buena Vista Formation and Cho Chu Kang Pluton. The effects range from quartz crystal recrystallization and mineral lineation to penetrative anastomosing schistosity and metre thick zones of strong myelinitic foliation. Thermal metamorphism has also been observed locally near intrusive igneous contacts. Within the Sajahat formation, this has produced conspicuous horn felsing, which has largely effaced pre existing foliation. Pula Ubin Pluton rocks in close proximity to the contact with the Pula Sakudo Pluton also appear to be more massive and granular than elsewhere in the unit. It's also worth considering that horn felsing may also occur elsewhere in the subsurface if other as yet unmapped Cretaceous Plutons are present. The landmass that is Singapore has been in a tropical latitude since the Jurassic resulting in a prolonged history of tropical weathering that includes both recent weathering and also extensive paleo weathering. This has resulted in substantial alteration of intact and rock mass properties. In Singapore, the nature of weathered rocks and depth to rockhead are possibly the most important aspects of the geology for most civil engineering operations. Unfortunately, they are also particularly difficult to predict as they arise from a complex interplay between heterolithic protoliths, faults, tephysite, and groundwater levels. A significant volume of work has already been published on bedrock weathering and residual soils, and to devote only a few minutes to this topic therefore does it no justice, but I'll at least try to summarise some of the key points of interest, and instead urge you to find out more information from these publications if you haven't already read them. The depth of weathering within sedimentary and plutonic igneous rocks is highly variable, with weathering grade 6 reported at depths up to 45 metres and grade 5 from near absent to depths in excess of 100 metres. Generally, the rockhead interface, which is commonly taken to be the grade 3-4 transition, varies between 15 and 45 metres, but depths are recorded in excess of 50 metres. The example here is a case in point and shows borehole core recovered from 51 to 55 metres depth. These deeper occurrences of weathering are most likely to be associated with major fault zones and occurrences of tuffisite, though it's also worth considering that in some cases it may not be modern weathering at all, but paleosols or even soft sediment fill karstic features. 
In addition to the depth, the nature of the weathering profile is also highly variable and often at site scale. Weathering grades are also commonly missing and sudden transitions from soil, grades 5 to 6, to rock, grades 1 to 2, are reported to be common, particularly in low-lying areas of plutonic igneous rocks and within quartz-rich sedimentary rocks. Core stones, particularly in weathered sedimentary profiles, were previously thought to be rare, but more recent studies have reported local occurrences of core stones up to 6 metres in diameter within parts of the Bukatima Centre, and possibly up to 9 metres if we consider the boulders of the Fort Canning Formation may be core stones derived from the Kuzu Formation. Core stones are also more likely to be encountered in close proximity to faults and tuffisite affected zones, and at greater depths than in more competent rock masses. In addition to recent weathering, paleosols and paleoweathering profiles also occur within the subsurface, often buried below unweathered rock. Paleosols are fossilised soils that have been preserved by burial, which may, through subsequent burial and diagenesis, have become lithified into a rock. Paleosols are particularly common in the Clementi member, and to a lesser extent its parent unit, the Boonlay formation. The image here is a really good example of the paleosols of the Clementi, which appear in the left in vivid red tones. Unconformably overlying it are the grey sandstones of the Bukit Batok formation. Both these units are clearly highly indurated. They are rocks and there is only relatively minor evidence of modern day weathering processes with some orange staining of a few fractures near the base of the Bukit Batok formation. The Fort Canning formation is also thought, at least in part, to be formed by paleo weathering processes that acted on the Kuzu formation prior to being buried by the younger sediments of the Bedok formation and Kalang group. This association with the Kuzu formation means that the Fort Canning formation may be more extensive than is currently reported in the literature. The new engineering geology map of Singapore highlights the areas within the Kuzu formation where this buried paleoweathering surface is most likely to occur, and also the potential for significant occurrence of paleosols within the Clementi member. In summary, Singapore bedrock has been subject to a number of forms of mineral alteration that affect the rock in very different ways. The overall effect of metamorphism has been the reduction of primary porosity through recrystallization, and as a result, an increase in a range of other properties such as rock strength and stiffness. Locally, the development of foliation will have also produced strength and deformability anisotropy, and in a few places may have also reduced tensile and shear strength. Conversely, weathering will have done the opposite, producing a porosity increase and corresponding reduction in strength and stiffness. The degree to which this will have occurred will also vary significantly between weathering grades. The highly variable nature of weathering has also produced core stones in some areas which can be particularly problematic for site investigation as they are often as strong as unweathered rock and their occurrence in boreholes easily mistaken for rockhead. An additional layer of complexity is added by the occurrence of paleosols and buried paleo weathering surfaces which often underlie soils and rocks that have not been subject to any historical or recent weathering processes. It's also worth adding that a weak but pervasive hydrothermal alteration has also been observed in parts of the Bukatima Center, and particularly the Simpan Pluton, and substantial alteration has also been identified locally associated with tuffisite affected rock masses. In terms of bedrock hydrogeology, there are just a few points which I'll summarise here for context. More information is available in the memoir, though it's worth pointing out that the data available from the BCA Deep Ground Investigation Programme and within the published literature is rather limited. Some groundwater can be found in nearly all of the geological units of Singapore, although the amount varies considerably. In low-lying areas, the water table may be within 1.5 metres of the surface and on higher ground is found between 5 and 25 metres. Groundwater levels will also fluctuate in response to rainfall, and in coastal areas and near the mouths of major rivers, they may also be a tidal influence. 
It's also worth noting that there are reports of artesian water-bearing layers encountered in moderately to highly weathered igneous rocks and also in the superficial deposits of the Klang group. There are also three known thermal springs in Singapore. Two, which are located a few kilometres apart in the Sembawang and Mandai planning areas, are located within the notably radiogenic Simpang Pluton. And the third, on Pula Tikong, is close to the map junction between the Sajahat and Pengarang formations. The most well known of these is the Sembawang Hot Spring, which has been recorded as having a flow rate yielding 2.5 litres per second and temperatures of between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. The location of these hot springs is shown on the new geological map. The highest permeability values are recorded within superficial deposits and in grade 5 completely weathered bedrock and are through intergranular flow. However, the porosity of all unweathered to slightly weathered bedrock units is very low, generally less than 1% in igneous units and less than 2.5% in sedimentary units. The aquifer properties of the rock mass are though also affected by both weathering and the presence of discontinuities, which affect overall permeability. And while there is a trend of increasing porosity through the Sentosa group and Buena Vista and Bukit Batok formations, the permeability is still expected to be dominated by fracture flow in all of Singapore's bedrock units. Data from the BCA Deep Ground investigation and in available literature indicate that permeabilities in the sedimentary units are generally higher, in the order of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8 metres per second, than in the igneous units, which are in the order of 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 7 metres per second. This is attributed to a greater frequency of fractures. It's also worth repeating that carbonate rocks within the Pandan and Tuas formations can contain karstic features, which if saturated and connected to a source of recharge, may provide very rapid flow rates. Another source of localised variation in permeability will be dikes, which are found in both igneous and sedimentary bedrock units. These can act as barriers to groundwater flow, but where dike walls are highly fractured, they could concentrate groundwater flow and higher permeabilities approaching 10 to the minus 5 metres per second have been recorded. So how does this geological variability manifest itself with respect to physical and mechanical properties? And what role can the new geological framework play in helping us better constrain them? For the most part, I'll be presenting these data using box and whisker plots, as the use of medians and percentiles is considered a more statistically robust treatment for geotechnical data than classical parametric statistics. This is due to the non-normal data distributions and the influence of extreme outliers on mean values and ranges. For those that are not familiar with the box and whisker plot, the main features to note are the bold vertical line in the centre, which represents the median or 50th percentile, the box, which represents the interquartile range between the 25th and 75th percentiles, the whiskers, which are 1.5 times as long as their corresponding interquartile range, and potential outliers, which are all those data that plot outside the box and whiskers. Unsurprisingly, some of the most pronounced effects on properties are due to weathering. The data demonstrate that there is a notable increase in porosity and a corresponding decrease in uniaxial compressive strength, Young's modulus, point load, RQD, and P wave velocity with increasing weathering grade. For intact properties, the difference in all cases is relatively minor between grades 1 and 2, but much more significant between grades 2 and 3. For RQD, the change between grades 1 to 3 is much more consistent and then becomes zero, apart from a few outliers, for grades 4 to 6. For P-wave velocity, there is a relatively consistent reduction in velocity from grades 1 to 5. As mentioned previously, the porosity of all pre-Cenozoic rocks is very low and generally less than 1% in igneous rocks and less than 2.5% in sedimentary rocks. These plots show a comparison of rock porosity for weathering grades 1 and 2 only by lithology type, geological unit 
and by geological unit for a single lithology type, which in this case is granite for the igneous rocks and sandstone for the sedimentary rocks. The greatest variability in porosity within the igneous lithology types appears to be associated with mingled and mixed mafic and felsic rocks, and in sedimentary lithology types with mudstone and volcanoclastic rock. This perhaps reflects the fact that these rocks are more brittle and therefore likely to have a greater propensity for microfractures. The extremely low porosity of the sandstone conglomerate and carbonate rock reflects the fact that they are thoroughly recrystallized as a consequence of low-grade metamorphism. Within the igneous units, the sympang pluton has noticeably greater median and range of porosity than the other plutons. Weak pervasive hydrothermal alteration within this unit may account for this increased porosity. Within the sedimentary units, there is an increase in porosity with age in the Drong and Suntosa groups that becomes increasingly apparent in the younger geological units from the Kent Ridge member and onwards. The trend does not continue with the Buena Vista formation, and this is probably consistent with a greater degree of regional and dynamic metamorphism observed in the Jerome group and Buena Vista when compared with the Sentosa group and Bukit Batok formations. Furthermore, the trends observed in both the igneous and sedimentary units are also magnified when the porosity of different units is compared using only data from the sandstone and granite lithology types. If we look at data for uniaxial compressive strength, again for weathering grades 1 and 2 only, for different lithology types we can see from the very broad box and whisker lengths that there is a significant variation in the strength of all rocks, but that within the igneous and sedimentary categories there is little variation in the median and range between the different lithology types. If we look at the same data by geological unit instead, then a greater difference in both range and median strength becomes apparent between the units, and particularly so for the sedimentary rocks. This becomes even more apparent when a combination of lithology type and geological unit are used. The other interesting things we can pull out are that igneous rocks are mostly very strong, 100 to 250 megapascals, though the microgranitic rock appears slightly stronger than the other lithology types. However, there are also a significant number of igneous rocks with strength below 50 megapascals, which is very unexpected in grade 1 and 2 weathered igneous rocks, and is likely due to the presence of tuffisite or microvein dissolution. Sedimentary rocks appear weaker than igneous rocks, but most sedimentary lithology types still have a median value in the strong range of 50 to 100 megapascals, with the exception of volcanoclastic rock, which has a median value in the very strong range. Within the igneous units, the dairy farm pluton microfasces appears notably stronger than the other plutons, while the simpang pluton is generally weaker. In the former, this is likely related to the grain size reduction brought about through quenching, and in the latter, may be due to weaker pervasive hydrothermal alteration. The sedimentary units of the Jurong group appear generally stronger than those of the Sentosa group, Buena Vista formation, and Bukit Batok formations, with the notable exception of the Pandan and Clementi member. The high degree of strength variation in the pandan may be associated with a greater potential for dissolution and precipitation of carbonate, while the weaker strengths observed in the clementi may relate to the abundance of paleosols within this unit. The higher strength values observed in the Buena Vista formation when compared with those of the Bukit Batok and Sentosa group are likely associated with a greater degree of tectonic deformation resulting in greater recrystallization and reduced porosity. The trends observe that intact rock properties also manifest in rock mass properties, though they also suggest there is a more significant role played by other processes including faulting, hydrothermal alteration, tuffisite, and localised carbonate vein dissolution. The figures here show a comparison of the RQD value of cores for weathering grades 1 and 2 by geological unit, and P wave velocity for grades 1 and 2, also by geological unit. Generally, there is a greater overall variability in the sedimentary units than in the igneous units, 
which is likely a consequence of a greater range of variability within those units, both in terms of rock types, but also in the degree of interbedding. It may also be due to greater rock mass variability produced by more extensive faulting within the sedimentary units. P-wave velocities are mostly in excess of 4,000 meters per second for all bedrock units, with igneous units generally appearing to have marginally higher sonic velocities. The Cenozoic bedrock formation is also shown here on the sedimentary unit plot for comparison and shows a significantly lower range and medium P-wave velocity. Within igneous units, generally lower RQD and sonic velocity values can be found in the Cho Chu Kang, Simpang and Singapore Dyke Swarm. This may be associated with the proximity of the Cho Chu Kang Pluton to the Bukatima Fault Zone, weak pervasive hydrothermal alteration within the Simpang Pluton, and a greater likelihood of a brittle response to deformation in more fine-grained and mafic rocks, which comprise the major proportion of the Singapore Dyke Swarm. Within sedimentary units, the Jurong group generally has higher RQD and P wave values than the Sentosa group and Bukit Batok formation. But the relationship between the units and rock mass properties is not as clear as for intact rock properties. This is likely due to the interplay between intact rock strength and stiffness, localized carbonate vein dissolution, and proximity to major fault zones, specifically the Pasia Lava and Murai thrusts and the Bukatima fault zone. In summary, we can see that there is significant variation in both intact rock properties and rock mass properties within the subsurface of Singapore, but that these properties can be better constrained by the new geological framework. We also see the significant role that discontinuities and alteration have in altering intact and rock mass properties at a range of scales, and that understanding the distribution of discontinuities and alteration at the site scale will be critical for informing any geotechnical design work. The revised understanding of the bedrock geology and variation in properties also presents a number of new, or in some cases revised, engineering considerations. With respect to foundation conditions, we should generally expect these to be favourable in unweathered to moderately weathered bedrock, grades 1 to 3, but locally poor conditions should be anticipated including at depth due to the presence of karstic cavities within carbonate rock, extensive mineral vein dissolution, fault zones, and tougher site affected rock. Of critical importance will be the identification of engineering rockhead, which may be locally highly variable, especially if core stones are present. These have been identified in the Bukatima Center, and similar occurrences of boulders in a fine-grained soil matrix are a well-documented phenomenon of the Fort Canning Formation, and consequently should be anticipated in the Kuzu Formation. Excavations will need to consider the potential for extremely high rock strengths, which are most likely to be encountered in Hornfels rock, which has been identified in parts of the Sajahat Formation and Pula Ubin Pluton, very fine-grained granitic rocks, which are notable in the Dairy Farm and Pula Ubin Plutons, and the fine-grained mafic dikes of the Singapore Dike Swarm, which are found in the Bukatima Center and also occasionally in sedimentary bedrock. The long-term stability of excavations and overall approach to design support in unweathered to moderately weathered rock will be largely governed by rock mass strength. This may be locally highly variable and sudden transitions in conditions may occur due to the presence of fault zones, dissolution of mineral veins in carbonate rock, tuffisite and highly variable rockhead and weathering profiles. Within the bedrock, it will also be these same features that will have the greatest effect on groundwater inflow rates. The relatively high radiogenic potential of the Simpang Pluton means that it's the likely heat source of the hot springs on mainland Singapore. Hydrothermal groundwater presents both a potential resource for low temperature geothermal, but is also a risk to subsurface excavation and particularly tunneling. The high concentrations of uranium and thorium also present significant potential for radium and therefore for radon gas. With respect to material reuse, unweathered igneous rocks and some of the strongest sedimentary rocks are likely to produce high quality aggregate. The unweathered to moderately weathered bedrock 
will also usually be suitable as general granular fill. However, in both cases, screening may be required to remove undesirable materials. Within igneous units, these undesirable materials will include weaker materials such as tuffersite affected rock and highly weathered rock, but will also include cryptocrystalline silica and strained quartz, which have the potential for alkali silica aggregate reaction. These may include rhyolite, which is found in the dairy farm and Pula Ubin plutons, myelinitic rocks, which occur in the Chochukang pluton, and Hornfels rock, which may occur in parts of the Pula Ubin pluton close to the contact with the Pula Sakuda pluton. Within the sedimentary units, undesirable materials will include weaker rock, such as highly weathered rock, and also weaker unweathered rock, which may be interbedded with stronger rocks. It also includes organic rich mudstone, which has been identified in parts of the Drone Group and Bukit Batok Formation, and may contain pyrite that can oxidize to produce iron oxides, sulfuric acid, and sulfates. There is also the potential for alkali silica reaction from aggregate with silica and strained quartz. This may occur in myelinitic rock, tuff, and also Hornfels rock, which occurs in the Sajahat formation. There is also the potential for alkali carbonate reaction from dolomitic carbonate rock, which has been identified in parts of the Pandan formation. For ground investigation, this new geological understanding is particularly profound and is about much more than using new names for geological units. The recognition of far greater variety and variability of lithologies, deformation and alteration has significant implications for all aspects of ground investigation. Many of these features are beyond the traditional scope of standard soil and rock descriptions, but often have significant implications for geotechnical engineering or may be diagnostic features of particular geological units. Approaches taken in ground investigation can be significantly enhanced by considering geological context. For example, when drilling boreholes in areas where core stones may occur, appropriate termination criteria will be required to correctly identify rockhead. In areas affected by tuffersite, faulting and mineral vein dissolution, high quality rotary core drilling and careful core handling will be critical for rock mass assessments in order to differentiate drilling and handling induced fractures from natural ones. Horizontal and inclined boreholes should also be used more routinely to reduce bias in discontinuity datasets and identify and characterize faults which are predominantly vertical or subvertical. And in areas where there is a risk of hydrothermal fluids, consideration should be given to using downhole temperature measurements. Successful application of geophysical investigations will only be possible where there are distinct variations in the properties of units at imageable scales. For example, within the bedrock geology of Singapore, with the exception of the difference in seismic velocity between the weathered and unweathered zone, the contrast between layers is such that the reflected seismic signals will often be less than 5% of the input signal. To reduce variability within laboratory test data, additional descriptions of samples will be required to properly characterize features that are likely to affect properties, including weathering grade, hydrothermal alteration, dissolution, tuffisite, and degrees and types of metamorphism. This will not only enhance confidence and help constrain variability within these data, but will also help establish more robust property correlations Uncritically, site investigation interpretation will have to consider a multitude of factors to make sense of the borehole logs and laboratory test data, including highly dynamic deposition environments within sedimentary units, the complex intrusion history of the Bukatima, several irregular and unpredictable unconformities, paleo weathering and recent weathering, and extensive structural deformation that has resulted in folding and faulting from the millimeter to kilometers scale. In this presentation, I've only touched upon some of the key aspects of the geology and how they influence the properties and behavior of the ground and some of the potential engineering considerations that arise from this. 
a number of publications have also been produced that provide significant further detail on the geology and engineering geology of Singapore. The new geological memoir is copiously illustrated and provides a detailed account of all aspects of the geology that have been presented in this series of lectures. This includes a chapter on the engineering geology and an appendix summarising the physical and mechanical properties of different units. A supplementary data folder is also available that contains detailed geological logs for all the stratotype boreholes and reference sections, and the geotechnical data obtained from the BCA Deep Ground Investigation Programme. The new geological maps include a bedrock map, superficial map, combined geology map, and an engineering geology bedrock map. As well as showing the distribution of the geological units, they also provide a range of additional information in the form of cross-sections, inset diagrams and text boxes. The engineering geology map is attributed with 15 engineering geological formations. These units are a combination of seven principal geology types based on common lithological assemblages and genetic origin, and eight subordinate geological features which highlight the potential for localised variation or present specific additional engineering considerations. These include foliation, horn felsing, karstic cavities, paleoweathering, paleosols, xenoliths, tuffisite and radiogenic potential. And the results of the Practitioner's Guide to the Bedrock Geology, which has been specifically produced to help those engaged in ground investigation and ground engineering works to adopt and benefit from the new geological framework. It provides guidance on classifying and naming rocks, identifying bedrock units, recognising boundaries, faults and fault rock, and information about other geological features that affect rock properties. There is also a chapter that summarises the key geological characteristics and geotechnical properties of each bedrock unit in Singapore. A supplementary data folder is also available that contains core photographs from all the stratotype and reference boreholes acquired as part of the BCA Deep Ground Investigation Programme. As with the previous presentations, please place any questions you have in the Zoom chat and we'll collate and answer them on the 24th of November. Thank you.